Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you all here this afternoon for this um, SMS uh, extension on digital platforms and ecosystem that I have the pleasure to uh, co-organize with uh, uh, Professor Pinar Oskan uh, from um, Oxford Side Business School. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Annabel Gower from the University of Surrey. Uh, I'm a professor in digital economy at the business school and the director of the Center of Digital Economy. I am very excited about um, this, the panel that we're going to have this afternoon. This particular panel um, is a, is a star-studded uh, panel looking at uh, one of the central questions of the day, the digital platforms, economic and social impact, and uh, the changing regulatory landscape. We're going to have uh, Dr. Christina Kafara, who will join us later, Professor Ariel Ezrahi, uh, Dr. Lina Khan, uh, Mr. Richard Kramer, Professor Philippe Marsden, and Professor Thomas Ovelletti. Um, to give you, um, to give you, um, um, to give you a, an introduction, today we are at an inflection point and there is a milestone happening uh, in the economy. This week was, um, as you know, um, uh, the, the, um, the DOJ announced that there was going to be a, an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft, uh, against, I'm so sorry, against Google. Um, just a few years ago, um, Mark Zuckerberg was leonized as uh, the person of the year. And there was a huge amount of enthusiasm about uh, innovation coming from Silicon Valley and taking advantage um, of, of the internet and creating those new digital platforms. But more recently, uh, that enthusiasm has turned to concern, uh, especially concerned about domination of big tech. And in a COVID um, economy, we have seen that while the rest of the economy is, is, is going down, we are increasingly more uh, um, dependent uh, and using uh, those big digital platforms and uh, we both need them and at the same time they have become uh, so powerful, more powerful than some states that there are concerns coming from a lot of different areas. Now this, is, so as I said, um, this week was, uh, you know, the Department of Justice accusing uh, Google of abusing its monopoly position. This is a defining time, and I want us to look back a little bit at history. Every generation is having its big antitrust lawsuit. So today is 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 Google, but uh, in 1997 we had antitrust lawsuit with um, with Microsoft, uh, and going back to 1975 there was an antitrust lawsuit with IBM, and these were the giants of the day. And these lawsuits were, 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 were looking at technologies that, yes, these companies had promoted, but they had become so central and so important in the economy that what had started as private activity was becoming considered as um, these companies acting as regulator in their own market. And too many businesses were dependent upon them. And um, societies started to realize that they didn't want all these important decisions to be held purely in the hand of, of, of those businesses. So why this panel now? Uh, I have, um, for those of you who know my research, have been uh, studying and exploring uh, platforms for over 20 years. And in the last um, a few years, I have been privileged to advise uh, governments uh, looking at uh, the evolution of these markets. Uh, in particular, um, I'm a member of the, of the European Commission um, um, Observatory for the Online Platform Economy, and uh, the European Parliament has asked me uh, to write a report recently, which I'm still working on, on the social and economic impact of digital platforms. And, um, um, and this panel plays, play, play, plays a role in that. We, as a community of uh, uh, management scholars and strategy scholars, uh, have a lot to learn. There has been a lot of activity uh, in regulatory circles. Uh, thank you to Simonetta Vizzotto for this slide, which I've updated a little bit. A lot of reports uh, from different governments to look at the state of competitiveness, 
of these markets. And uh, we, are, um, we have to learn from uh, other disciplines. And I strongly believe that having looked at these platforms for, for over 20 years, that the real issues that we are uh, facing today are issues that will not be solved by looking solely at them from uh, single disciplines, be they um, economics or law. Uh, I think that uh, what uh, the real insights will be coming from combining insights from multiple disciplines. In, in today's panel, we are extremely privileged to have uh, not only astute observers and commentators of, of what's going on, but actual um, influencers directly in, in, in this process. And I will tell you more about each of the speakers as I'm, um, I'm asking them some questions. So I think that as a, as, a, as, a, as a community of management and strategy scholars, we face a unique opportunity to uh, actually bring some insights if we successfully combine our uh, knowledge with what has already uh, been done in these other disciplines. Just uh, one example, um, a, a paper that I just published um, a couple of weeks ago looks at um, looks at uh, digital platforms boundaries and suggests that um, in order to to understand the the business models of these uh, of these companies and how those business models are are going to evolve, we need to understand the interplay between uh, platform sides, which economists know a lot about. Uh, scope of the firm that we as strategy scholars know a lot about and uh, the evolution of digital interfaces, the directionality of the, of the, of the data flows with which, uh, for example, information systems uh, and, and computer scientists know a lot about. This is, I think, the kind of example, uh, there, there's a lot of different issues that we can all contribute to. And I'm very excited to, to welcome our, our panelists today. I'm not, I'm going to, so, um, so I'm going to introduce each, each of them more in detail as I will be asking questions. And uh, we are going to start with, um, we are going to start with uh, Professor Ariel Ezrahi. Ariel Ezrahi from, uh, from Oxford University, uh, Professor of Competition Law at Oxford University, Director of Oxford Center of Competition Law and Policy, and author of the books uh, Competition Overdose and uh, Virtual Competition, The Promise and Perils of the Algorithm Driven Economy. So Ariel, um, I, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to start by, by asking you, um, uh, you know, how do you see the most pressing issues in the markets where digital platforms operate? Um, why don't you tell us what the most pressing issues are and, and, and how you see them? Uh, thank you, Annabelle, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to join the panel. Um, so what I thought uh, is that I'll, I'll, I'll give us two perspectives. One, a more wider perspective that looks at markets, and then a more narrow one that looks at platforms. And I'll try to highlight some of the things that really are at the core of discussion when it comes to competition law, market economics, and things that really affect the policy. So the first thing, <clears throat> sorry, the first thing that I think is, is really significant in our debate of platforms is really to appreciate uh, the change in market dynamics and market characteristics. And the report that Annabelle mentioned uh, and many other studies uh, give reference to network effects, data is critical input, advanced analytics, of course, algorithms, big data, big analytics, um, but also to the asymmetry of information, the gap that is created between the users and the platforms and how those platforms were able to sustain market power because they can make use of the advanced analytics, the advanced data, and that gap in the ability, the ability to affect transparency um, and so forth. And for our debate, this is crucial because it goes to the heart of the ability of the market to correct itself. So when competition lawyers and competition economists think about what are the key issues in the platform economy? One of the key issues is to appreciate that whereas often we have an assumption that markets can easily self-correct and that when in doubt, 
you should allow the market to run its natural dynamic and that will often resolve the problem. And what we see is that because in platform economies, so many markets actually tipped already in favor of the incumbent, this doesn't happen. And this is the first element that is crucial because that is the trigger for intervention. And whereas we have many scholars and enforcers that have acknowledged that already many years ago, you really see how in other parts of the world, uh, they've been affected by tranquilizers that were distributed either by lobbyists or interested parties that made them uh, still believe in the idea that intervention is not necessary and markets can easily self-correct. So I think as a starting point at the wider perspective, it is important. As we add the platforms into that debate, one thing that is, that is significant is to appreciate that platforms are not passive players in that discussion of the market characteristics. In other words, this is not a passive event. And those of you who had the opportunity to read the Congress report, and I'm sure Lena will say a few words about that as well, see from the descriptions there, and of course in other cases that you have around the world, see that the platforms are not a passive bystander that just happen to benefit from network effect and therefore the market tipped. They are actively seeking to change the market dynamics. And that is important because it's not just the fact that it's not easy to correct these markets. You also have to work against um, a strategy which at its heart is aimed at making sure that those markets do tip in favor of the leading platforms. And here, again, from a competition perspective, one of the interesting thing is to appreciate that we sometimes have a difficulty to filter all the information and the effects of the platforms on the market using traditional antitrust law, traditional competition law. Because many times you can say that they have market power, but we find it difficult to quantify the harm. And here is another challenge and another important element for us to appreciate the fact that these games that we see, these platforms and their operations do not work in the same manner that you had in brick and mortar because of zero pricing, because of the ability to use data as the main currency, because of the ability to degrade quality of services, uh, all these elements together make it a bit more challenging for competition. And another aspect, and this is an aspect that Maurice and I cover in competition overdose, is that those platforms are now no longer just participants, very powerful participants in the market, they are the market. So many of those platforms are the architects of an ecosystem where they determine all the parameters of competition. We refer to them as the game makers. So as the game makers, they control the ecosystem, they control the rules, they control the taxation that one needs to pay, and they control the access to us, the users. And therefore, it is quite interesting. We got used to analyze competition, assuming that competition is a dynamic process that happens on the market. But a lot of the competition markets that we look at at the moment, the interfaces take place on a private platform. They take place in an arena where the rules were determined already by the platform. And therefore the platform can put in place rules that favor its own interests over others. This goes beyond the idea of delisting, pushing out, excluding, abusing, and exploiting. This goes to the heart of you having to travel through, it, through an autonomy, having to pay taxes in order to reach the other end of that autonomy and get access to users. So what do we do with that reality? How do we cope with that? That is a great, a great challenge because of course, as everyone I think appreciate, intervention has to be measured. We always wanna make sure that we don't chill innovation and investment. We wanna make sure that we don't over rely on regulation because we appreciate government error. But at the same time, if you accept the changes to market and if you accept what we see now that competition happens within these private ecosystems, then you have to increase your intervention. You have to do something in order to remedy that. And indeed the discussion as we're gonna uh, see later on today involves 
ex ante measures, ex post measures, and sometimes also involves regulation. One last comment from my end, Annabelle, you mentioned the De Department of Justice complaint, and of course, this is a really uh, significant move. But I want to, to just highlight, because of all of this nature of, of the markets and analysis, we have to appreciate the limitations of antitrust. We are dealing here um, with a law that was designed to deal with brick and mortar. We are dealing with jurisprudence, especially in the US, that was narrowed over the years, a system uh, that is to some extent has been affected by ongoing voices that limit its application. And already those of you who read in the newspapers, you can see already the pushback from Google and some of the other parties that represent its interests saying the Department of Justice lack proof of consumer harm. Uh, and the same things you will see when it comes to uh, discussion on the recommendations from the Congress. And the reality is that even when we have those small successes, like the Department of Justice filing the complaint, this is a game where competition and antitrust laws are mostly reactive. And as such, they are relatively limited. And it's important because then you start to see how many times those companies engage in the game of just delaying, delaying the procedure, just creating more delays and more doubts. And because of that, I think the importance is to appreciate that as we move forward, we should carefully consider not only antitrust and competition law, but seriously consider the framework, the regulatory framework, and the way we can create a system in which platforms and competition work for us and not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ariel. That was that was uh, wonderful. Um, I would like to invite now, and we will have a chance, by the way, to have a discussion amongst the panelists after every one of them will have given their remark, remarks. And then at the end of the session, we will open the floor to have Q&A. But this was a wonderful way to, to set the scene and, and tell us what the real big issues are. It's now my pleasure to invite um, to the floor uh, uh, Lina Khan, Dr. Lina Khan. Lina, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, if I may introduce um, Dr. Lina Khan for those um, who, who, who don't know her. Uh, Lina is a, um, is a is so, so something of a celebrity uh, and she has really shot to, uh, to the forefront of uh, activities around um, around uh, big tech and uh, the power of big tech with a paper she wrote when she was only 29 years old uh, a few years ago uh, about Amazon, which was uh, reported widely um, in the press. And uh, you, may have, um, you may have spotted her recently at the judiciary in the US, the House uh, Big Tech uh, Committee hearing. Here she is just behind uh, David Sicilian uh, and, and Lina has um, been one of the major contributors to the very recently published investigation of, of competition, um, of competition in, 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 in digital markets. Um, uh, Lina, um, um, you published your, your Amazon paper in 2017, uh, but both the, the public discussion and the enforcement posture of the agencies look very different today. Uh, in the United States that they did in 2017, um, with much greater awareness of the power that these dominant platforms wield. What are the key dimensions of platform power that the US discussion is focused on? And how successful do you think these efforts will be at reining in the power of the dominant platforms? Great, thanks so much, Annabelle. Um, and thanks so much for that kind introduction. And it's great to be on this uh, panel with, with so many distinguished speakers. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that the discussion in the House, it, the discussion in the United States has evolved enormously over the last uh, four or five years. Um, and now most recently, you know, marked by this recent action brought by the Justice Department and lots of reporting that further actions must be maybe imminent. Um, in terms of the specific dimensions of their power that the U.S. discussion has been focused on, I'll uh, recap 
one of the frameworks that the House report identified for its concerns. Um, this was an investigation that the House pursued of Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple over 16 months. And it concluded that while these firms differ in key ways, um, they have different business models, studying their business practices reveals a common set of facts. So first, as, as Ariel alluded, you know, these are gatekeepers. They control access to key channels of distribution, which gives them enormous power to set the terms of commerce. And there are certain commonalities in how they've used that power. So first, they've wielded that power by charging exorbitant fees, imposing oppressive contractual terms, extracting valuable data from the individuals and businesses dependent on them. The key fact being that these dependent partners would not agree to these increased fees or degraded forms of service, but for the platform's power. Um, a second way that they've used their power is to maintain their market power, right? So by controlling the infrastructure of the digital economy, they've been able to surveil other businesses to identify potential rivals and have ultimately bought out, copied, or cut off their competitive threats in many cases. Um, so this is, you know, the, the fact pattern with Facebook's use of Anavo data to buy up WhatsApp, to, to cut off other competitive rivals. Um, the hearing that the United States had with the CEOs in July uncovered and made public um, various forms of communication where you saw, you know, both at the highest levels of the firm, um, executives discussing how they could use this competitive intelligence to ensure that they maintain their market power. Uh, and third, these firms have used their gatekeeper power to further entrench and expand their dominance, right? So whether through self-preferencing, through predatory pricing, um, or exclusionary contracts, the dominant platforms have been able to exploit their existing power to gain power in additional markets. Um, so one example that the House report talks about is how um, you know, these firms are able to use their dominance in one market as leverage in negotiations in an unrelated line of business. Um, that's something that we saw with Amazon as well as with some other firms. And I'd say the vast majority of the House's findings identified conduct that fell into one of these three categories. So, you know, abusing power through um, ex extortion or imposing oppressive contracts, abusing the gatekeeper power in ways that allowed the firms to maintain their power, and then use of gatekeeper power to expand or entrench that power. Um, in terms of the effects of market power, um, you know, the House is a congressional body, not a law enforcement body, so it gets to decide what the laws are. Um, and so that gave it latitude to really broaden its focus beyond the current antitrust framework and look at harms, including um, you know, the effects on innovation and entrepreneurship, the effects on user privacy, um, the effects on journalism and the independent press, um, which was a major concern for lawmakers um, who are you know, seeing, looking around them and just every day seeing you know, a new newspaper, a new independent source of news shutter. Um, and lastly, um, looked at the effect of the platform's market power on economic and political liberties. So a recurring theme um, you know, throughout the House report was the prevalence of fear um, in the marketplace where business partners were extremely reluctant to speak oftentimes even on a confidential basis because they were aware that you know, any public indication of their cooperation could lead to economic retaliation. And more generally, I would say there was an uneasiness about the fact that the livelihood of so many businesses um, was dependent on the arbitrary whims of one or a small number of firms. And I think those types of discussions and feedback really evoked the foundational concerns that lawmakers had when they passed the antitrust laws, right? If you, if you look at the legislative history in the US, it's rife with discussions about private tyrants um, and the ways that monopolies really pose a threat to Republican institutions um, precisely because they wanted to prevent this type of fear. So that was something that the House report was also able to discuss. Um, in terms of remedies that the House report recommended, they really fall into three buckets. Um, so one is legislative remedies. Um, so these are ex ante remedies that lawmakers can directly legislate. And so this included line of business restrictions, uh, non-discrimination mandates, interoperability requirements. Um, the second category was ways to strengthen existing antitrust law. So this includes both ways to make merger law more sensitive to nascent competition um, to really strengthen the incipiency standard. Um, it also includes ways to really make more robust monopolization law in the US, which up until this past week, you know, could really seem like it was in a slumber for uh, two decades. 
Um, and then the last bucket was ways to strengthen enforcement, both on the public side, so looking at ways to really ensure that the public agencies are using the full set of tools at their disposal. Um, one finding, I think, of the report was, was really a, 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 a sad conclusion that the antitrust agencies in the US had really failed to do their jobs over the last two decades, where in many cases they had information about these mergers beforehand. Um, they only really, in the case of Facebook, which made over 100 transactions, they really only investigated one in any depth. Um, and all but the Google ITA transaction were really blessed without any, um, any action. So I think thinking through, you know, what are the dynamics that have led the agencies to really underperform and how can we ensure that they're really using the full tools at their disposal. And then also thinking about ways to strengthen private enforcement. So in the US, uh, private enforcement is a real key pillar of antitrust enforcement more generally, but the courts have introduced a whole variety of obstacles that have really made challenges by private parties much more difficult. Um, we're starting to see, um, you know, some private parties speak out. So we saw Epic Games um, file a lawsuit against Apple, uh, which a lot of people are, are focusing on to see how that develops. But overall, you know, the, the high costs as well as the unfavorable legal doctrine has really chilled private enforcement. Um, lastly, I think um, I'll just know quickly about the, the DOJ case. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement that this case was finally filed. I think for those in the, in, you know, in Europe, it, it has a lot of resonances with uh, the European Commission's Android action. Um, but this case is fundamentally about Google's monopolization of search access points, which, as the Justice Department argued, both deprives rivals of paths to market and then also deprives rivals of access to consumers, advertisers, um, or data at any type of scale. I think one thing that was interesting about the case is that it's not just backwards looking, um, looking at how Google engaged in these tactics as internet usage was migrating from desktop to mobile, but it also gestured to the way in which Google may be attempting to do the same as we see search activity migrating from mobile to voice, right? So, so platforms tend to panic whenever the underlying platform uh, risks evolving to a new technology. And the Justice Department noted that, um, you know, there are certain contracts that Google has with automotive makers, um, smartwatch device manufacturers um, that may signal the same type of exclusivity um, and Google may be, you know, illegally trying to maintain its monopoly once again. Um, so I think that forward looking dimension is really important. And, you know, all reports suggest that the state AGs may be independently filing a suit. And I think it'll be interesting to see if they really follow up and, and further build out that forward looking dimension. Thank you so much, um, Lina, for these um, extremely, obviously, um, um, well informed and and uh, and um, uh, again at the forefront of, of this activity, these ideas, these thoughts, and these uh, this inside view about uh, what's really going on. I would like now to um, to uh, give the floor to Professor Tommaso Valetti. Tommaso, you are with us, yes? I saw you. Yes, I am. If you could, fantastic. So, Tommaso, um, let me go back to the to the next. Um, to the next slide. So, um, Professor Tommaso Valetti, I love that photo of you, Tommaso, if I may. <laughs> Tommaso and I were colleagues at, uh, at Imperial College London for 12 years. Tommaso is Professor of Economics and Head of the Department of Economics and Public Policy at Imperial College Business School. He's also Professor of Economics at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. He's a non-executive director of um, the board of the Financial Conduct Authority, and perhaps even more uh, relevant to today's discussion, he's the ex-chief competition economist at the European uh, Commission's Directorate General for Competition. Between uh, he was the in that role between 2016 and and 2019. So, Tommaso. Uh, you know, obviously, you're free to react. You know, to to the to 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 to, to the remarks that we've just heard. But perhaps as a starting point, I wanted to ask you: What is your assessment of how much success has the European antitrust actions have had on competitiveness of these digital markets? Has antitrust been successful so far in reining in the power of platforms? Why? Why not? And what lessons can we learn? You have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annabelle, and thank you. Uh, Pinar as well for organizing this conference on digital platforms and ecosystems. So 
Um, obviously, lots of things are happening right now from the other side of the Atlantic for once. Lina explained very well what the Congress has been doing and the Congress gave like the bigger picture. It's a political document that they produce a very good one. And uh, there's also a wealth of evidence there. It's a very dense document of 450 pages. And in a, in a sense, they are trying to discuss of uh, the relevance of the current rules and whether we should change them. And then there is the DOJ recent suit, US versus Google. It's a specific uh, case according to the existing law. Uh, finally, it's happening long overdue. It uh, struck me when you said, Annabelle, that you mentioned three cases in the US antitrust when it comes to big tech, 75 IBM, 98 Microsoft, and 2020 Google. So it seems like there is a regularity. There is a case every 22 years and a half. So not much, not much. Uh, but anyway, the, the US versus Google is, um, is, is good because it's a vindication of the 2018 EC case uh, Android. It's almost, I mean, across the Atlantic, they don't recognize much of what we do in Europe. That's okay. And, uh, but that's uh, an exact photocopy of the European Commission case in the Android case, uh, the three practices which are being contested are anti-fragmentation agreements, mobile application distribution agreements, the so-called MADAS, and the revenue sharing, which is exactly the, the Euro European case. So long overdue, a uh, vindication of uh, the European Commission's approach uh, with respect to the, also the economic analysis. What I do like a lot in the um, DOJ's document, which I would recommend people to to read because it's just just over 50 pages and the format and the font is very agile so you can read very quickly i love the the language of the document this is where europe can learn perhaps it's simple language it's not legalese uh, they go you know straight to the problem they throw nice uh punches up front they they basically say google stop with this narrative that you are supplying goods for free because nothing is free because uh, you will sit on a business model which is generating 150 billion dollars a year that's a lot of money that somebody has to pay and also consumers are giving you a lot of data that no other company can actually get so so nothing is free which i love i also like the the other uh, narrative that they try to immediately to dismiss that competition is one click away something that google has been doing for many many years saying uh, uh, well actually because of the default option and of the consumer inertia and i didn't mention that uh consumers don't change so please stop telling us that there are a few geeks around that can change the the you know, the search engine or, or whatever other things which is an, are, are installed as a default because this is not the common behavior of the average person in this market. And the other good uh, uh, punch they throw up front is, uh, is uh, basically asking, this is the core of the case that we go through in the US courts, Google, if you are so good and you're telling us you're fantastic and probably they are fantastic, but you're so good, why do you need all these contractual clauses why do you need to impose rest restrictions, which are a, a, a phenomenal impediment to, to competition? Why do you need to pay Apple $10 billion a year, every year, to be installed as a default search engine on their phones also? So if you're so good, why do you create such massive barriers to entry? Because it's impossible to compete in these in this markets any longer. What I do also like in this line of the, of the, of the, of the arguments is that the DOJ goes straight to the core of the matter, which is Google, you are a phenomenally successful uh, company making a lot of money from uh, paid search. This is your bas business model. You're doing, you're doing everything it takes, including anti-competitive behavior to defend that. And I like it. So all the attention is concentrated on what matters really. Instead, uh, the European case was more following this uh, very silos approach uh, that sometimes antitrust has, which is let's try to define markets. As, as, as Ariel said, it's very difficult to apply our normal SNP test to markets with a zero apparent price. And so the commission went, let's do a SNP test on a reduction of quality. But again, this is as if there was competition between Android and iOS, which is actually, it's, it's a void which is beside the point because there is no competition when it comes to 
the monetization because Google is installed on both. So this kind of approach doesn't make sense to tackle the real core of the anti-competitive issue there. So there is lots of lot, lot, lots of good things uh, from the US, which, as I, as mentioned before, also are a vindication of what has been done earlier in Europe. So at least on the analysis of these problems, Europe was uh, um, in the in the front line. You will find everything I, I've just said also in the decision of the, of the Commission, but it's more hidden here and there. The the picture is less clear because I follow the more usual. Uh, uh, legal approach to a case in normal markets, but as these are slightly different. So, but anyway, so that's a positive um, for for the Euro European contribution, and you can find lots of what I just said in the Android decision. What did not go so well? It's clear. It's in, in, in front of all of us right now. The timing. It takes so long to run these cases. I don't know who was quoted recently. Maybe it's one on these panels who said. Uh, you know, by the time you've decided on these cases, you have eventually found a remedy, which we haven't yet, so it's just too late. It's like sending an ambulance to a funeral. So this is the current uh, uh, antitrust approach coming so late. We have realized that it is extremely difficult to, to, to restore the competition lost because the counterfactual is not just damages, there are private actions for that, but we, the, the right counterfactual should be if Google had not done those anti-competitive practices many years ago, where should we be? Where would we be right now? And it's very difficult to get to that point now because it's too late. Also, there is, a, 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 I hope, a recognition that cease and desist, which is the standard practice in Europe, which is probably correct in normal industries, just doesn't work here. Just doesn't work here. For similar reasons, several reasons, but the most fundamental one is uh, you just Google is just too smart. Technology company are so much more advanced than enforcers to understand technology. That's their, their business, and you cannot leave them the driving seat because this leads to delays, 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 and then in this game we never find a solution. Prior to Android, there was Google Shopping. 2017 was the conclusion after six years of several, I remember of investigation, and in 2020 we still. We're not sure we have a remedy at all. So this is uh, highlighting that season disease that should change, uh, and probably we need structural solutions. Um, and when I mean what I mean by structural solution is divestitures and breakups. Um, something curious about breakups uh, is that uh, in uh, many other instances, from regulation to voluntary breakups, uh, we've done them. We've experienced some breakups went well, some went less well. Instead, when it comes to the antitrust community, the debate stops with the typical phrase, it's so difficult to unscramble the eggs. And then we stop there. We don't devote any further thinking. Instead, we should devote very serious thinking for, for two reasons. One reason is that perhaps breakups are the only structural solution to some of this problem. And secondly, you must have a realistic uh, breakups in your toolbox because this puts the enforcer in a, in a, in a, in, in a good a position when they are negotiating remedies, because this is a default. If it is not uh, realistic, if it is not credible, then again, the, 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 the Googles of this world will do whatever they want, because they, they don't fear that there could be this outside option, which is potentially applicable. My last comment, if I may, one minute, uh, this is a strategy conference. So I wanted to uh, bring a different point of view. Um, and the and the point of view is that it is really unusual in this debate, which is typically led by uh, economists, lawyers in the first place, and by the incumbents, the big tech. It's really difficult to find entrepreneurs, startups, or not so small uh, technological companies which are not dominant yet. So their views are almost never heard. So perhaps because they're very busy in the, with their business, they have some other things in mind, but it's so important that we start asking them what they think about it, what they think about the remedies that are now on the table, especially when it comes to uh, APIs and some, some open interfaces, open architecture, some interoperability, data portability, because I really would like to understand 
how they think that their incentives might be affected in a different world where we you don't just need to be swallowed by a Google or a Facebook of this world in order to make money, but you can survive if there was a more open ecosystem, you could survive and perhaps the ambition of innovation would, would actually change. So it, it would be great if in this conference with people looking at different issues, if this uh, vantage point would be also um, taken into, 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 into account. It's the small entrepreneurs, the small technological companies, not the big investors, because the big investors, they like money and the big investors, they, they will always say, oh, if you want to put your money, bet your money, you can still bet. Now you would be betting still on the Google and Facebook because these are the lucrative, um, uh, um, that, that's, that's where money is being made. So monopoly is, is good for investors, but it's not good for society. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Tommaso. These, these were super interesting remarks. And um, it's great to understand both your point of view of the current uh, American uh, antitrust lawsuit and your looking back at to what uh, may have been some of the issues that, uh, that we have been facing uh, here in Europe. I would like to invite now um, uh, Professor um, Philip Marsden to be our next speaker. Uh, Philip, you are here. I saw you on the... Can, can you unmute yourself, please? Hello, how are you? Very good, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip, uh, we are uh, delighted that you are here. Um, Philip is... Uh, Professor Philip Marsden is um, the Deputy Chair of the Bank of England's um, Enforcement Decision Making Committee. Um, Philip is a Professor of Law of Econo and Economics at the College of Europe in Bruges. And he's also uh, the author, uh, one of the uh, five authors of the Furman Review, Unlocking Digital Competition, which has been uh, hugely influential uh, and uh, was, uh, was asked um, by the, he was asked by the ch chancellor to join this group of experts for this uh, UK Treasury study. And more recently, um, he wrote a, a report uh, on restoring balance um, to digital competition. So, um, Philip, as, a, as an actor um, uh, in this debate, um, I, um, I wanted to ask you the following question. Um, what is your view on the, lesson, uh, on the lessons we can learn from the last um, activities in attempting to make these markets competitive? What are the limits of uh, antitrust and how important is ex ante intervention? Is it still time to discuss what new rules should be drawn or should we begin to work on how to solve um, enforcement challenges? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annabelle. And I think uh, Ariel, uh, Lina and Tommaso uh, very well answered the first uh, two or three questions of yours. And I I'd like to reserve my time, if I will, to talking a little bit more about why it is indeed time for ex ante rules. Um, yes, in our Furman report, we talked about improvements to antitrust, uh, speeding measures up and, and also uh, some ex ante regulation and uh, concepts of a code of conduct for strategic market status firms and gatekeepers. Um, in my recent report with um, Ruprecht Podson, uh, which was written in the context of the German presidency of the EU, um, this is a report that looks at indeed at uh, what we humbly call uh, sensible rules and some suggestions for effective enforcement to restore balance to digital competition. So as we know, the European Commission is stepping up its efforts to come up with new regulation for digital gatekeepers. And Executive VP Margarita Vestager has proposed the new competition tool, which we're very familiar with in the UK and in some of the jurisdictions as a market investigations reference tool and also some form of ex ante regulation for platforms. So what uh, Ruprecht and I were trying to do in our report uh, that we issued a couple of weeks ago was the actual proposals for some ex ante rules and um, some quite serious proposals we make for enforcement frameworks. Um, one of the criticisms you know, we used to get uh, in particular from Bill Kovacic um, when we did the Furman report is, hey, you didn't place it. You know? And what, what he doesn't realize is that the treasury, when they asked us to do the Furman report, rightly asked us not to place the enforcement mechanism because then everybody would focus on that. And what we wanted to do was to land the, the idea that you need something more than antitrust. So we landed that, I think, in the UK pretty successfully with the Furman uh, document. And, and now we're trying to move on to, well, how and where 
will you place these rules and the enforcement frameworks? So we're moving on to the how, that's what Ruprecht and I are trying to do. How do we design the new tools and regulation to correct market failures in relation to digital platforms before the abuses of market power happen? How do we reset the balance so that genuine innovation and choice prevail and that all businesses have an equal opportunity to compete in the marketplace? And indeed, how do we ensure the right environment so that the best product wins, not just the, the platform or the game maker, as I mentioned it, that offers it. So we have three principles that underline our, our search for, for new regulation, freedom of competition, fairness of intermediation, and a focus on the sovereignty of economic actors, including us, to take our decisions autonomously and with the appropriate information. So these principles we describe intentionally as having a constitutional character and importance. And thus we feel those three principles should be the foundation of any new regulation in this area, especially European regulation. So we have uh, some rules in our, in our, in our report. It's pretty, pretty short, pretty brief. Um, and they, the rules are in the frame of do's and don'ts. We have a lot more do's than don'ts, but we set out obligations and prohibitions relating to platform openness, uh, neutrality, interoperability, uh, we agonized over the precise wording of our self-preferencing prohibition, so I encourage you to look at that. Um, On-platform competition obligations, non-discrimination, fair terms. Uh, we have a section on controllability of algorithmic decisions and access to justice and access to information. And also just a focus on choice and the use of data, choice for customers, and simplicity, not forcing products on people through behavioral nudges. So what I'd like to focus on right now, though, to answer your questions, is the stage of enforcement. What institutional design do we need and how do we enforce those new rules? And this is the core of our, our whole debate now. Um, I think we've moved on from whether there's a problem, but now what do we do about it? So what we propose, and it's, it's very much in a European framework, of course, because of the nature of the report, but I think it would equally apply to any jurisdiction that is considering ramping up antitrust enforcement and having a complementary regulatory regime of uh, ex-ante regulation for gatekeepers. So what do we propose uh, institutionally? We propose the, the institution of a new early alerts unit at DG Comp, which would monitor market developments, particularly movements to what we define very carefully as unnatural tipping and the consequent ramifications for the application of our, our rules. And that unit would report particularly when conditions are arising such that this new competition tool or market investigation regime should be deployed. We propose a new platform compliance unit at DG Connect that would ensure that the new regulation, the do's and don'ts, remain fit for purpose, um, given that such market dev developments reported by the early alert unit itself may show that some of the rules need to change or be, be, uh, be tweaked, uh, particularly when, the, when this, these kinds of rules may need to be interpreted. And we hope this, this unit would issue guidance. Um, and finally, we, uh, we propose a new platform complaint panel that would be set up within Connect to deal swiftly and independently with private complaints, uh, particularly, for example, about misuse or, or denial of access to, to data. So I just wanted to uh, em emphasize that in, in, in looking at the enforcement of ex ante rules, we rely on three key factors. You know, in the movement to this new regulatory approach, we have to have a, a situation where the compliance with the rules is automatic and swift. It's not waiting on nine to 12 years of enforcement activity about a narrow defined case. Uh, we have to move to an area where enforcement requires new institutional capabilities and a strong interplay between the units I've described at DG Comp and DG Connect, um, and indeed in, uh, with national institutions and other market actors. And the rules need to be flexible enough, uh, thirdly, so that they can be updated without too much complicated legislative proceedings. So we, of course, uh, we welcome the enactment soon of a new market investigations regime uh, as contemplated by the consultation in the EU. Um, and we, uh, in our paper, we note some insights from the similar tool in the UK. I was deputy chair of the open banking uh, CMA market investigation, uh, which it introduced open API and data portability remedies, which we felt went with the grain of technological developments rather than pushing them back. But we see a strong need for an interplay between these institutions. Uh, we don't want to see the creation of a new regulator that would take years to staff and finance and they'd be lobbying. We think that the existing teams with some new institutional powers and, uh, and arrangements can do the job properly. So I'll just close with an example of the interplay we, we perceive. We foresee that the early alert unit would have the ability to identify the cause of tipping markets 
engage with the platforms, the forums, and, and others to identify the extent to which a, a further market investigation, you know, is warranted. But throughout, would be able to engage with the platform compliance unit in DG Connect to ensure that that tipping isn't happening because of a violation of the rules. For example, about self-referencing or exclusivity arrangements or denial of interoperability. And so if those rules have been complied with during the platform's growth and there have been no violations, then you know, maybe it's not a situation of unnatural tipping. Um, we think that the role of the early alert unit should be described, therefore, in a way as a kind of an investigatory arm, in a sense, for both Connect and Comp. Um, and it could indeed uh, extend to recommending a full investigation of the market as contemplated by the new competition tool. But what we're much more interested in is not necessarily waiting for a solution after another two years of a market investigation, but instead the first act being to communicate with the Connect platform compliance unit and get the rules obeyed. They're ex ante rules and they should be obeyed automatically and swiftly and make sure that the platform is in compliance. And that might therefore avoid the need for a two year market investigation and all of its delay and, 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 and uh, for before remedies. So our operating principle throughout is to remedy pro uh, problems as expeditiously as, as possible, if not prevent them in the, uh, in the first place. So um, the early alert unit would closely co cooperate with the various other agencies, including nationally and internationally. And then these ex ante rules and compliance with them would be monitored by the platform compliance unit in like a supervisory function, which we have at the FCA and the Bank of England and many other places, you have supervisory functions, and then you have enforcement and adjudicatory functions. And that's where the platform complaints panel comes in. You know, many people have recommended something like this, whether it's our Furman report or Fiona Scott Morton and Ariel with the Stigler report, we need to have a very fast arbitration mechanism or almost like an ombudsperson for pl platforms. So the complainants don't feel that fear that Lena genuinely uh, and, and ap very aptly described. They have to be able to feel that they have a, a safe space for want of a better word to actually make these complaints. And we see this with our groceries uh, code adjudicator in the UK that, that that space can be and that anonymity can be granted. Fast adjudication uh, by independent adjudicators with experience in the field, rapid remedy for violations, um, a quick remedy for those who wish to stop certain practices or indeed order the release or access of data instead of leaving that to the public judiciary. And we talk, of course, also about, you know, the rights of defense and appeals after that. But the main point we're trying to make in this study is that it is indeed, as you say, Annabelle, high time for this kind of uh, regulation. And it's going to happen anyway. So wouldn't you rather be part of tweaking and ensuring that the enforcement mechanism and the rules apply? rather than all these debates about the fact that there's no need for the rules at all, they're going to apply. I'd rather have all the critics in the room arguing with us about how they should apply rather than all this like bizarre denial that there's a problem at all. Thanks very much, Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, this, this, this is fantastic. And I would like now to invite um, uh, to, uh, to, to the floor um, um, Richard Kramer. Richard, are you with us? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you very well. Um, uh, Richard Kramer is, is a founder of Arete Research, which is a, an independent uh, equity research firm. It's pioneering in the sense that it was, uh, I think, we were the first or perhaps one of the first um, uh, equity research where there was no conflict of interest, where some people are giving you advice about uh, uh, what to buy and others are giving analysis about where the market is going. He's, he's a top ranked technology analyst. He's followed technology stocks over three uh, decades. He's very sought after commentator, whether on TV or he's got a very popular uh, conversation on YouTube with uh, Professor uh, Scott Galloway from NYU. Uh, so Richard, uh, I think you are um, perhaps uniquely among this panel uh, able to, to provide a different angle based on your expertise. What is your view of this discussion? And uh, to which extent do you think antitrust and regulation will have the expected impact? Uh, thank you very much, Annabelle. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, if I may, and let me, while I'm doing that. Um, oh, I, oh, you don't have um, to do that because I actually. Okay. If you, if you, you don't, you don't to have my, to do that. Oh, great. Okay. So, yes. um, first of all, let me say I'm, I'm hugely honored to be um, here on the panel with people like Lena Khan and Tommaso and, and others. I think, um, you know, uh, huge compliments to the work that you've done. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a counterfactual 
presentation of how I see things, which is going to make people very uncomfortable. It's not the position I want to see as a citizen, but it's what I feel the reality as, as I'm seeing it is. Now, we get asked all the time by the world's largest tech investors and world's largest investors as a whole as to why tech is doing so well. Um, it clearly did not face the same existential crises as many other sectors. It's had this continued investment. And you know the lockdowns, if anything, have increased the power of big tech because of the all of our reliance on digital distribution and inf infrastructure platforms. Um, big tech clearly has ample resources. I mean, Google is one example. They have 117 billion dollars of cash. As a whole, these five companies have have 320 billion of net cash. They spend 90 billion of capex, 100 billion in R and D, and generated 170 billion of free cash flow in the last 12 months. Um, so that is a pretty dominant position to start off with. Um, and, and really that is sucking all the oxygen out of the room in the sense that those five companies are now almost a quarter of the S&P 500. So they are simply uh, absorbing uh, enormous amount of investor capital uh, in a de facto way. Um, I'll come on to the other points in a second if you pause for a sec. Um, I think there is no need uh, in a way for restrictions on their M&A because I think they already have a uh, an understanding, a very clear understanding that large scale acquisitions are unlikely to pass antitrust scrutiny. That is why none of these big tech companies have bought anything large uh, in the last uh, four years, really, uh, as much as they might have been tempted to put their cash to better use. And I think this last point, which is uh, particularly concerning, you know, if you look at the comparable top computing and engineering universities in the world, I'll just take Oxford as an example, Annabelle. Um, they have about 170 computer science faculty and 100 and so fa 115 faculty on the engineering uh, front. Um, and if you look, the last time we were able to do this sort of LinkedIn scraping of of, of the big tech guys on on it, from 2017, um, you know, Google had 3,500 PhDs or, or masters in computer science or engineering, and is well over 30,000 computer scientists right now. And the numbers are fairly similar for Facebook, Apple, Amazon and uh, Microsoft, and you can see just the sheer incremental year-on-year -year increase that these companies are able to put into the ground on, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of resources. So the last, if you make the last point, these companies really are kind of sucking all the oxygen out of the room, if you will, uh, and, and it's, it's a fact you, you know, we just have to deal with. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, this is, I, I'm afraid, our view of real politique here. Um, you know, the regulatory efforts have been highly fragmented. Um, privatization and, and privacy law and competition law have, have many times been at cross purposes or have, have failed to reconcile with one another. Um, and I, I do fear that if there was an open API made available to Google's uh, vast search data set, the only other companies that would have the computing power to make use of it would be Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and, uh, and Facebook. Um, I did go on uh, uh, with Scott Galloway two years ago, and I said, well, we don't think the breakup of the four is gonna happen. Um, that was two years ago, I'm still waiting. Uh, again, this is not the position that I might like to see as a citizen. One option for these companies is they will just continue to break the law. Um, you know, Take a look at GDPR. Uh, there are, there's ample evidence that many companies flaunt GDPR, uh, simply refuse to comply with the law. Um, a second option, if you will, Annabelle, is that they will just outgun the regulator. And uh, this is, again, it's not something I like to see as a citizen, um, you know, but, but the, the Irish Data Protection Authority, which we're all waiting on to act on, on Facebook and Google, has a 12 million euro budget. And I like to joke that that's kind of a kombucha budget at the Google can canteen. It uh, just isn't simply sufficient to, to reverse engineer the algorithms uh, to understand what's going on. And, and, and a third strategy that these companies have employed is clearly to compromise everyone. We understand that Facebook uh, um, works with something like 400 law firms around the world to put them offside, uh, whether it's unemployment law or contract law or what have you. It's a very convenient way to make sure that pools of talent are, are not being used against them and being used for them. It's something I've talked about with our next panelist, Christina, at length. Um, if you look on the next, the next points, um, these are un some five unfortunate reasons why I fear it will happen. And again, I, this is not my preferred outcome. This is just the reality. As I said. First, um, unless you believe Edward Snowden was a fantasist, um, the CIA or NSA CIO would have 
um, dream to invent Facebook and Google. Second, these are companies spending 50 and $35 billion respectively uh, annually on R&D and CapEx. And I think every politician can easily be swayed, uh, unfortunately, by the prospect of an R&D lab or a data center built in their, in their district. If you go to the next point, Annabelle, um, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are businesses that pay tax back to the U.S. Uh, on business outside of the U.S. If you place a French ad, uh, an ad in French on YouTube in France uh, with Google France, uh, it generates tax receipts for the U.S. Uh, I, I don't believe this uh, sort of uh, violin playing about fighting the Chinese on AI, but you can see these companies prop that one out. And these are the best export industries the U.S. has ever uh, really come up with in terms of economic power. They have incredibly powerful lobbies and to many respects um, uh, have, have proven that in the way in which they forestalled regulation. So if you continue on, uh, I'm afraid I look at some of the um, some of these hearings a little bit like Kabuki theater. There are some foregone conclusions, uh, but I'm, I'm still struggling to see the application of the action, um, the, the budget allocated to the FTC, the DOJ uh, and others to actually proceed uh, with the case that we might all like to see happen to make the market more competitive. And if you go into my last slide, I'll throw out what I think is the most uh, promising prospect um, uh, uh, for uh, regulating uh, big tech is and that's really the analogy of the financial markets apologies for the um the formatting of this and i won't go through all the details but i was really disappointed that the house report didn't go more into detail in the way in which uh, google's ad tech stack involves tying an exclusionary contract conduct my analogy here is that imagine if jp morgan owned the new york stock exchange they were the single largest traded stock on the stock exchange they made a market in their own stock and were the leading broker to every other stock in the stock exchange. And they ran the entire settlements and clearing system. Now we understand uh, how to regulate the financial markets, at least in principle. Now, the, the, the hundreds of billions of fines paid by big banks will tell you that that regulation has not always been entirely effective, but this at least does provide a roadmap for how you could um, regulate various aspects of, of of the of the ad tech markets, and um, I, I do fear as well as a last point um, that there have been some misunderstandings about the numbers that have been thrown out. I don't believe for a minute that Google pays eight to twelve billion dollars to Apple. I think that was come for, came from a single poorly sourced and poorly researched uh, analyst report. Um, uh, I think you know Google's distribution tax last year was fifteen billion dollars. I think that's split among a wide range of parties, and I would love to see, as as someone who analyzes Google for many years, I'd love to see the detail behind that. But I do fear that if uh, Google is no longer uh, is prohibited from paying those other uh, distribution outlets to be uh, left as the default search engine on Safari, that they will end up by dint of their brand becoming the de facto default. And that I think is, is a very worrisome possibility that Google would pocket the savings of not paying the telcos, uh, uh, device vendors like Samsung and Apple um, and, and many other uh, folks, um, but simply uh, would just would, would end up being the default uh, search engine choice for people because it has become a verb in our society. So I think there are some serious unintended consequences we need to watch out for. I would love to see Philip, the, the kind of things Philip mentioned put into practice, but I do fear that we haven't mentioned regulatory capture here, which is the whole body of literature around that and just how, uh, how ineffective regulation has been in the last decade. And uh, I wish Tommaso a lot of luck putting the, uh, the scrambled eggs back into the in each individual egg, but I think that's again, a very difficult prospect. Again, uh, I'm not happy to be uh, giving you all this um, uh, uh, difficult, uh, counter perspective, but um, uh, in, the, in the name of debate, uh, I'd love to hear why none of this is, is gonna end up being important and, and we are gonna actually see effective regulation at some point in the future. And with that, I'll leave it and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I think it is fantastic to have these uh, contrasting, uh, this contrasting view and uh, perhaps a pessimistic one, but uh, certainly a voice uh, 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 worth paying attention to. It is now my great pleasure uh, to invite um, uh, Dr. Christina Kafara to join us. Christina, you are you are here, yes? Yes, yes. 
fantastic. Uh, if I could just very briefly, um, you know, summarize uh, some of your accomplishment. Uh, Dr. Kafara is an award-winning Oxford PhD economist with 20 years of experience advising on some of the landmark cases in Europe. She has uh, headed uh, uh, very large teams of economists and, and has been a leading and continues to be a leading contributor to the policy debate. She directed and coordinated uh, empirical and a theoretical economic analysis of several of the most yeah. high profile cases. Yeah, leave the CV, Samson. leave the CV, Annabelle. No one cares. Let's go to substance. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, you want to you put get, your question you get to, to see me? Why, you get to see why, 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 why. Uh, why, why, why Christina always want to get to the point. So you can bring a unique perspective on this debate. Uh, really, I mean, feel free to talk about whatever you want. I thought perhaps you could give us a perspective both on European and US antitrust, but perhaps you could summarize for us what you see as, as the main issues in this whole debate and what should everybody in this audience be clear about and what are the most burning questions that are, that, that are still or should still be open. All in five minutes or in four. No, I'll give you as much time as you want. No, I'll be I'll be brief. And let me thank you first uh, for inviting me. I am uh, regretting that I was able to join only very late. And so I haven't had the benefit to hear the beginning of this panel, which is certainly an handicap for me. And it will mean that the, the audience will have to be patient. I will probably say things that others, that others have said as well, but you know, I'll try and say them my way. Let me start with what I think is a, a must in every, every situation uh, like this, where as a practitioner, I uh, go and talk, I need to provide disclosure as to uh, who I have worked with. Uh, so uh, mine is fairly long, but I'll go through it. I have I've been working for, uh, I've been assisting the state attorneys general in the US in their uh, and um, their investigation of Google. I had worked uh, on multiple matters adverse to Google in the past. I never worked for Facebook or against them. I had worked for Microsoft. I've done work for Amazon, for Apple, for Uber, uh, for Netflix, uh, for News Corp. So these are the kind of, uh, uh, this is, this is a, a list of, of people. I think disclosure is always important, but of course, as anyone knows, I, I always say what I think. And uh, these people, whether I work for, for them or not, may like or not like what I say, and that's, that's okay with me. So um, I'll try and give a sense for, you know, how I, I, I see now this sort of the current state of the debate. I'm sure that, I, again, both Tommaso and Lina will have given you uh, strong views on this. But fundamentally, in digital, we are in this uh, big uh, inflection point. Uh, there is a big change in the conversation, which is a global change. And the main driver for this is a strong sense that instead of uh, essentially being faced with a digital world, which provides us with uh, the ability to switch and download and face disruptive innovation over the time, has funneled us into a number of very, a very limited number of attention brokers that effectively control every size of our life. And they are gigantic, their size is unfathomable. I mean, Richard was giving some numbers. Uh, there were days in May when Apple added to its market capitalization the entire market value of Boeing. Together, they are the size of the European stock markets in terms of valuation. So this is almost uh, uh, unthinkable in terms of size and the notion of the power that comes to it, uh, with it, is, is what concerns us very, very deeply. There are differences, of course, because the business models matter and create differences in, in the way we actually uh, uh, worry about uh, these, these platforms. There are unfunded models, which I would argue are the really, really toxic one, they're the bad guys, the Google and Facebook, because they create pretty inherent incentives to self-preference, to drive traffic on the internet towards themselves, uh, to personalize products advertising in ways that ultimately uh, are not good for consumers when they are performed by a monopolist. And there are other businesses. Uh, Amazon is a, a major online retailer. Apple is an app store owner. And the, here the concern has got a different nature. We worry about the relationship between these gigantic platforms and the businesses who make a living on them and who are in a position of dependence. So uh, uh, there, is, there is this great unevenness of bargaining powers between Amazon and its sellers, between Apple, uh, Apple and the, and the developers, and the question of how competition on the platform between an owner of the platform and the, and the businesses that uh, uh, rely on that platform is the fundamental one for, uh, uh, for politicians, for regulators, for us, uh, ultimately. So 
it is not a single issue though, and there, is, is a, there isn't a single kind of unique solution, which is why uh, you know, the natural way to think about this in, in, for some time has been to, to do some antitrust enforcement, right? And certainly in Europe, um, we have, uh, I think, pioneered uh, relative to the US, a number of investigation, a number of initiatives, uh, and 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 uh, the the we we try to to address the specific uh, issues that these platforms raise on a case by case basis. Google with its own specificities. There are uh, investigations open of Amazon and, and and Apple looking at their own specificities. The problem in Europe in, is is though that. Um, and I think you've probably heard it from Thomas already, there is a strong sense that these well-meaning investigations, this well-meaning intervention hasn't delivered. The remedies have failed uh, to ultimately deliver a solution to move the dial. And so uh, for that reason and more, we are now at the cusp of a major change towards a regulatory approach. A regulatory approach, which is motivated by a biggest set of geopolitical, political economy considerations. There is more to it than just the failure of antitrust. Of course, there is a big sense in Europe that uh, things have changed after the demise of uh, the UK, which is weighed anchor, anchor and moved uh, away with Brexit. You have a Franco-German bloc in which uh, the, 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 um, the initiatives that are being pursued are very much driven by 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 these by these by these two, and so there is a notion of uh, data sovereignty, uh, need to pursue B two B data platforms, and to make sure that European industry is in disadvantage relative to, you know, the two big blocks, America and China, which we're being faced with. That industrial kind of sort of data policy stuff is very much there. It is part of what motivates the shift towards regulation. But uh, uh, as I said, much of it is also a sense that antitrust as an enforcement tool hasn't been able to do very well because not only it takes time, but because we've been too timid uh, about the remedies that we've been able to actually impose. We have given these companies the ability to, Google in particular, design their own remedies, cease and desist. Don't come back with the same thing. Don't do the same thing over again. But of course, the asymmetry of information and the recidivism of these companies is, is massive. The incentives to do wrong things is big. And so you get uh, remedies that don't work and they're replaced with something which is uh, just as bad. So uh, I think that we're seeing now this, this, this uh, great and inevitable shift. I can hear that there will be, I expect that there will be a great deal of, of course, of resistance because these companies are resisting all of it. I mean, we're not gatekeepers, right? We're not, what, 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 what is a gatekeeper? Not me, not me. No, I account for 500 billion of commerce, but I'm not a gatekeeper. No, I will never be. So there will be a lot of nonsense, which is going to be kind of peddled around by companies and their advocates about what is a gatekeeper, what isn't a gatekeeper, and why should they not? But I think that uh, there is a big question as to whether the regulation competition combo is going to be better going forward. And there's also some resistance huh, at the level of uh, the antitrust agencies to the idea that this is really tilting too much towards regulation. And so they lose ground. This is a major land grab on the part of regulators. Whereas the commission, the antitrust authorities of France and Germany and the UK are saying, well, no, it's not so fast, we can do our antitrust a bit better, you know, going forward, and we'll do a bit of quasi regulation, it will be kind of fine. So, it is a landscape which is still completely under construction, and how uh, it will fit together is very unclear. Philip has got some good ideas for how these things might develop. Very uh, different uh, position from where things appear to be in the United States. I mean, the US really has been, frankly, way behind in terms of enforcing uh, in, in terms of antitrust uh, uh, investigations for 20 years. There's been a complete permafrost. I'm, I'm sure Lina will have educated all on, on, on that. And now we are beginning to see in the last three weeks a major change, right? We've got Lina's report. We got the complaint by the DOJ on Google. More change in the last three weeks than in the past 20 years in the antitrust direction, okay? So no antitrust happened, nada, nothing at all. 
for 20 years now, we are getting maybe some antitrust actions. Will they work? Will they actually go to, to term? Uh, they seem to have been framed at the, the DOJ Google investigation, which is a copy of the Android one in Europe, seems to have been framed well, but it's fairly narrow. So we will see how that uh, plays out. Please, that it is looking like the Android investigation that we did in Europe. So it is, it is a good thing. Finally, there is a big, a big uh, gap. I, I think that there is, there is a sense in the US that uh, you know, regulation is not even to be discussed. Whereas in Europe, we are quite used to this kind of concurrence of competition and regulation. We had it for telecoms, we had it ever. Uh, I, whenever I speak to people in the United States, they say, well, you know, we, we just want to fire up antitrust. It's a little slow. Regulation is really kind of bad. Regulation never works. It is always capture and it does bad things and it never works and you don't want regulation. So uh, forward-looking people over there are thinking, no, we do want regulation and we need to think about it. So I know of a group, groups of people, academics and so on, who are beginning to think about how do we do smart regulation, even in the US. But there's still a big distance, I think, between that and the idea that it will be uh, in the near future. Let me stop there. Thank you so much, Christina. This, this, this was uh, super interesting. And so I am well aware that this is already 5 p.m. So those who have to leave, you know, of course, feel free. But I would love us to stay together for another few minutes. And, um, and perhaps open, uh, you know, instead of going through debating amongst the, the, the panelists who I think had each a chance to already to already um, speak, I would like to open the floor to Q&A if there, if there are people from the audience who would like to ask any questions. So perhaps if you could uh, raise your hand. Yes, yeah, so Michael. Michael, Michael Jacobides, please. Right, so a couple of uh, questions. The first one is for Philip. Philip, pleasure to hear you speak as ever. Um, I love the ideas, but on the other hand, I'm thinking about the realpolitik of the fact that right now, the in Europe, for instance, the national regulatory agencies have got no clue what the commission is doing and probably won't be briefed until December. So I'm thinking about a slight disconnect between our intent and what the process may come down to. I'm fully on board with many of the ideas, but how realistic do we think that these principles are? And the second thing for our penultimate speaker has to do with whether big tech will be listening. Um, I hear the question of the current might, uh, but I am wondering whether that is not being a little bit too excited by the current state of affairs in the sense that uh, the price uh, expectations that are embedded in the multiples will be hit if the market does start believing that their growth prospects are going to be ham hampered, aren't they? So the- I'll, I'll Thank you. Thank you, Michael. On quickly? Yes, please. Oh, so just yeah, I, I totally, I, I hear a lot of criticism about how this Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act, et cetera, uh, market investigation tool is being rushed through. Frankly, we've got decades, you know, even, even on Tommaso's 22 year cycle, we've got decades of evidence of the kind of problems that we're all talking about on this panel. Um, I do believe actually that a lot of the nations, the member states and countries around the world are in the same place on agreeing for the need for some extra regulation here. And I feel the European Commission is just, is just getting on with it. Um, it'll be, uh, in my enforcement model, it would be something where you are doing some testing it's through the adjudicatory model to make sure that you're not spending five years trying to find the perfect um, prohibi uh, prohibition words for self-referencing, but you just get on with cases. And then you can undo cases if you need to, if the situation changes. So I appreciate that's putting a lot on the regulator and there's concerns about capture and these kinds of points. But one of the best things that, uh, that comes out of the UK's market investigations regime and the adjudication in the UK is the independence of the decision makers. Um, and so I do, I do feel that that will, will be possible and will help assuage these concerns. Plus, you know, December 2nd for the EU regulation is, is, a, is a date that seems not that far away. It's still going to take ages to get it through the parliament and everything. There'll be ample opportunity for Google and Facebook to, uh, to participate and, 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 and influence and, and others, small businesses, app developers who might be concerned about the points that Richard was making about, well, we don't really want that interoperability. <laughs> You'd just be granting more power to, to the rest of the GAFA. That, you know, this should be uh, heard and talked about with technologists and, and experts, but I think let's get on with this because uh, we can't just keep waiting uh, and doing nothing. Thank you, thank you. Um, is there uh, one more question from the audience? Otherwise, I, I think I would, I would like to, uh, I would like to have one question uh, 
to, to you, to you um, uh, Philip, which is, how do you react to, to Rich's presentation, right? So what is your sort of one liner as to, to respond to, to Richard Kramer uh, pessimism about the, the, the effect of, of, of these activities? My one line is the world needs optimists and it needs cynics and it needs critics. And tell me more, Richard. I want to know more so I know what we're facing. Thank you. Okay, that's fantastic. I would like, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to ask uh, Pinar to join me. I don't know if you, if you, yeah, you know, and, you. and I would just, yes, Pinar, you know, and, and I just want to say a huge thanks to, to, to both, um, you know, our panelists. Uh, I think this, the, 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 this particular, uh, you know, they were both of excellent quality. Uh, we've seen on the chat a lot of, um, a lot of activities um, and, and, uh, and people are, are very happy with the content uh, we had. So huge thanks to, to all our panelists. And uh, we will be sharing, um, we will be sharing the, the video uh, of the event and we want to thank uh, University of Surrey and the University of Oxford uh, and the SMS. And Pinar, if you want to say a few more words, uh, please do. Thank you. I'll keep it very short. Um, I, I agree completely with Annabelle. Um, and thank, I thank you, Annabelle, as well as Emma and Martin in making this happen. I greatly enjoyed it, learned a lot. And um, I encourage everyone to stay in touch and uh, exchange ideas. Have a good weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank and you. thank Bye -bye. you, Emma. And thank you, Martin, for all your help. Bye, Bye everyone.